Welcome to the Industry Experts Panel at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. We have a packed 2019 already unfolding right in front of our eyes. Tom Beck, the founder of Portfolio Wealth Global's free financial newsletter, has jotted down the following key data points for investors, starting off with precious metals. Gold has broken above its 200-day moving average in the past few days, which is a well-known bullish technical sign. The United States government shutdown is now 17 days old. This makes it the second longest shutdown in history, and it still continues as this taping today. Interest rate hikes have probably been put on hold or unofficially canceled. 20 states have announced that they are raising their minimum wage, effective immediately, a range of $12 to $15 per hour. This move affects approximately 17 million employees. The China trade deal appears to not be getting any closer, which has caused the founder of FedEx to blame President Trump for economic woes and banked the highly anticipated crypto-backed custodian service has been delayed. With that update, as a background to this interview, we are honored to be welcoming Mr. Alistair McLeod. Alistair is the head of research at goldmoney.com. He has been a stockbroker and a member of the London Stock Exchange for over four decades. His expertise covers equity and bond markets, fund management, corporate finance, and investment strategies. Alice Dare, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm very well, and it's my pleasure, Michelle. Thank you for asking me. We are so honored to have you. We want to start off by taking a look at the past few months, going back just a little bit. The GDX is up by 25% since September. The GDXJ has rallied 22% since November. Gold has gained over $100 per ounce since October, and silver is finally starting to rally. But we've watched many false breakouts, which appeared to be real at the time, but were cut short. Based upon your expertise, what are the indicators that would confirm whether this is actually a bull market? Right. There are a number of factors. If we start with this time of year, for the last five years, gold has rallied from December through into the early months of the following year, and it's rallied quite strongly. I mean, noticeably. This time, the rally actually started a bit earlier. So that's the first thing. The second thing, as you mentioned, we're now breaking up above the 200-day moving average uh, with really some momentum. It's broken up from having been in a very oversold position on the futures market, which is another bullish indicator. Gold uh, might need some consolidation after such a good run, but we're beginning to see the 55-day moving average move up to make a golden cross with a 200-day moving average, which is likely to happen in the next week or two. So from a technical point of view, those are positives. There are fundamental positives as well. Uh, this is the time of year when, first of all, you have Diwali, which is the Indian festival, and that is in late November. And then you have the Chinese New Year, which this year I think is on the 5th of uh, February. And uh, again, uh, demand for physical gold always is very strong at this time of the year from those two major countries, which between them have a population of about two and a half billion people. So you can see that these factors are coming into play. I would also add a few other little tidbits, if you like. One very important thing is that central banks have been using low prices to accumulate bullion. We have seen some of the Eastern European countries like Hungary, Poland, accumulating bullion for the first time in a little while. We see Russia has almost got rid of all her dollar, uh, dollar uh, reserves and investments in dollar-denominated securities uh, and uh, replaced that with gold. At the same time, China, for the first time, indicated a small increase in her gold reserves. Now, my personal view, uh, and I have some evidence for this, is that China actually has a lot more gold than she's letting on. She only shows what she has in her reserves uh, as, I think, probably a fairly small fraction of her total because she has been accumulating gold 
very quietly since 1983 when she brought in regulations appointing the People's Bank of China to do just that. So you can see that uh, China, uh, Russia, uh, Europe, I mean, if you like, the whole of Asia, including India, they've started buying again too, as, as a nation as opposed to the people. Uh, the whole of Asia is beginning to accumulate gold. And what this tells me is that gradually over a period of time, the dollar will be replaced, if you like, as the international settlement medium uh, in Asia uh, with gold. Now, that is very, very bullish for gold. And if people actually begin to understand what's going on now, you can see that there will be very little physical bullion available in the market. On top of that, uh, portfolios are underexposed in gold, very underexposed in gold. So um, as we get more and more risk um, coming into equity markets, and we've seen a bit of a shakedown in recent months on that front, uh, and I also believe that uh, bond yields will begin to rise again because I think that the funding requirements of both America, Japan, and also the member states of the European Union are going to start increasing again as the global economy slows down, you're going to find that bond yields start rising, equities start falling. Where do you go in those circumstances to try and protect your capital? The answer basically is gold. Wow, very interesting. So you think that's the answer. You mentioned something about China. What would you guesstimate from your experience that they actually have on their uh, back shelves? That's a very good question. I analyzed the capital flows into China uh, from the initial investments uh, after uh, 1983 when the People's Bank of China took on that role, was appointed that role by the state to accumulate the uh, country's gold. The reason that was uh, the case was we were getting capital inflows going into China as uh, Western businesses were building factories and building production capacity in China. In the 1990s, that turned around from capital flows going in to exports and export surpluses beginning to develop. And that again meant that the People's Bank of China was ending up with dollars. They were getting dollars, 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 dollars the whole way through. Converting just 10% of those capital flows suggests to me that by 2002, uh, at contemporary prices, it is quite possible that the Chinese state accumulated up to 20,000 tons of gold. I don't know if this is true, but that is potentially what they could have easily accumulated. Now, the reason this is important is that in 2002, they opened the Shanghai Gold Exchange and they permitted members of the public for the first time to purchase gold. And that would be a signal to me that the state felt that secretly they had accumulated enough gold for their strategic purposes. Now, since then, they have encouraged their people to accumulate gold. They even advertise for Chinese citizens, go out and buy gold. It's, you know, it's good for you or it's, uh, it's attractive or whatever, whatever the adverts say. They were doing this campaign for a good two or three years. And the result is that ever since uh, the Shanghai Gold Exchange opened, uh, the ordinary people in China have accumulated an estimated 17,000 tons of gold. And that's the figure that has been delivered out of the exchange vaults over that period of time. So you can see that not only has the state got gold, the people have got gold. You go over to Russia, you see that the state has got gold. So far, uh, the people haven't been accumulating gold, and I gather there is a, um, a sales tax on physical bullion. Hopefully that will change, and I suspect it will change in the coming months. So all in all, you can see that uh, the demand for gold from the two leading economies in Asia um, are not just a coincidence, but part of a planned uh, approach, if you like, to do away with the dollar. Gold is central to the replacement for the dollar for those nations. Mm, they're very aware of what's happening. Interesting. Now, Alistair, shifting gears just a little bit, retail sales in the United States have shocked even the bulls with how strong they've been. People can talk about yield inversion all day long, but consumers have been cash rich since the Trump victory and feeling good. On the flip side, 
housing data has been weak. Do you foresee a recession in 2019, a slowdown, or just moderate growth? It's a little too early to say, but the indications are not good. There are two things I would point out. Firstly, uh, there are the tariffs. There's a tariff war with China. Now, so far, that's been relatively low level, but uh, they're trying to stop it escalate, es from escalating much further. Now, the reason this is important is that in October 1929, I think it was the 30th of October, um, uh, your uh, uh, Congress passed the first uh, round of tariff increases under the Smoot-Hawley uh, Smoot Tariff Act. Now, that was uh, at the end of that October. Those with long memories will know that October was a terrible month uh, in, uh, on uh, the New York Stock Exchange. Prices fell very heavily. It was the beginning of the 1929 to 1932 bear market. Tariffs were very important in undermining the future prospects for the U.S. economy. We have a tariff battle which President Trump has initiated, and it is interesting to note that as that tariff battle really got vicious, what happened to the stock market? It fell. So we need to watch that side of it very, very carefully. The other thing I would point to is there is a seizure in the bond markets when it comes to um, uh, commercial entities trying to seek funds. The uh, uh, investment grade and junk grade are finding it almost impossible to raise money in the markets for um, their development. So we have, if you like, almost a, 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 um, a strike, a seller, a, a buyer's strike, if you like, a bond buyer's strike in the markets. Now, that to me is indicative of a credit crisis potentially in the making. So that's another thing that makes me very, very cautious. I also think that um, as the economy slows, government finances will deteriorate. And as government finances deteriorate, we'll all start worrying about the demand for, um, uh, for, for, for government bonds at a time when the central banks are trying to reduce their balance sheets. In other words, there's less money flowing into the financial sector at the same time as the demands on the financial sector are, incre are increasing. That is not good for asset prices. Very interesting. Not a good equation at all, right? No. Hmm. Now, Alistair, from your perspective, how do millennials feel about precious metals overall? Do you feel that most millennials have taken the time to become educated or even remotely educated about the role that precious metals play within today's financial world? I'm afraid they have got no idea whatsoever. Any millennial who has an idea is very much the exception, not the rule. The first thing I would say is that people in the financial community seem to think of gold as an occasional investment. It was never an investment, it's actually money. I think part of the reason that it's sold as an investment is that people who, or businesses that have physical ETFs, gold ETFs, um, investment vehicles which are tied to gold, such as gold mines and so on and so forth, try and always look at these things as investments. They talk about them as investments. But gold itself actually is money. It's the soundest form of money and the oldest form of money used by man. And nobody understands that. <laughs> Except a few old gold bugs like me. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. If people, if people think it's new information, really. They're like discovering the fact that gold is money when, in fact, well, it's I, been money yeah, forever. Absolutely. It's been money forever. Um, and uh, the other thing that doesn't help is, of course, the central banks don't like a rival to their fiat currencies. So they continually say it's a pet rock or, you know, whatever they make up. They just don't want us to believe that this is actually real money. They want us to believe dollars, euros, pounds, yen, that's real money, but it isn't. Our stuff. <laughs> <laughs> don't look over there at that gold pile. <laughs> that's right. Alistair, are you seeing a transition of investors from cryptocurrencies back into precious metals? 
Um, well, you get some players who, you know, and they, these are not serious money men. They, these, are, these are speculators who will move, you know, from one to another and so on. I mean, we, we offer storage facilities for, for both those. We act as custodians for both, in, in effect, you know, sort of Bitcoin as well as gold, silver and all the rest of it. Um, I would say that um, any move between the two is actually overhyped. They are very, very separate entities. The cryptocurrency business, as you, um, as, as you are, I'm sure you're aware, has sort of more or less collapsed um, uh, over most of last year. Um, there's signs, I think, that it's picking up. But I think it's still controversial. I think that there is a future for cryptocurrencies, but it's a speculative uh, future. I would say that's very different from a future for gold. Gold is all about money. It is money. And there are times when you want to actually have some real money rather than state-issued currency. So I think the reasons for holding cryptocurrencies are very, very different from holding gold. Now, that having been said, if the purchasing power of fiat currency starts declining, I think that that will encourage people to move money from bank accounts into cryptocurrencies. And that could get a wave of uh, uh, cryptocurrency bull markets developing. And, um, you know, we now have a few vehicles like futures and so on beginning to be put together so that uh, institutional money, which must invest in regulated investments, can actually take part. So I think the future for uh, a good cryptocurrency is actually quite exciting. But please don't um, uh, confuse that with the prospects for gold, because gold is a very different thing. They may both go up in the future. Um, in gold's case, I think it's certainly because the purchasing power of fiat currencies will be going down. In the case of cryptocurrencies, I think it goes up partly on that, but mainly on speculation. Mm, right. Now, Alastair, in the United States, there really seems to be two separate economies, one for the rich and the other one for the majority of the country. And it looks like this is starting to cause internal strife with in the highest magnitude, do you feel that the traditional middle class lifestyle is becoming largely extinct within the US? Or can the United States still return to a more balanced, sensible way of growth? I think if the United States, it's incidentally, it's not just a problem from the United States, it's a problem uh, in most other jurisdictions as well. But I think if you're going to return to some sort of balance, I think uh, we have to get away from a situation where people make money out of uh, financial markets only, financial assets, speculating in financial assets, um, to accepting that the people who make money by producing things that are useful for consumers they are the good people. The people who make money in industry by lobbying government, in other words, crony capitalists, are not good. And I think, you know, you've got to have a fundamental reform to recognize that the purely financial guys, the bankers and all the rest of it, um, where they get rewarded huge amounts of money for what they do, for, particularly when they speculate, hedge fund people and so on and so forth, that, if you like, is a symptom of the system. But the system that I think is fundamentally wrong is the crony capitalist side. And uh, uh, people just don't manage to separate out in their own minds the way big business behaves from the pure capitalism, which actually is there to serve the consumer. And people are employed to make things, uh, to provide services for the consumer. That is the way capitalism proper works. We have to return to that. We have to get out of crony capitalism. We have to ensure that uh, the production of money just doesn't fuel um, uh, financial markets and really uh, sideline everybody else. And if we can have the reforms to do that, then yes, America can return, I think, to a far healthier condition. I have to say that I don't think many people actually recognize uh, these problems in the way I've just put them. And the first step is to recognize the problems in the way that I have put them. How would we go about that? Would it start with um, education in schools? Um, what, what do you 
what would you advise as a country how we might start that process? I think, I'm sorry to say that I don't think education is the answer because who's going to do the education? The establishment. The establishment which, you know, is backed by Doing and financed by crony capitalists. You know, we are actually stuck with the system we have. I think that the American people were grasping towards dealing with this very question that you have raised by electing Donald Trump. Now, I don't think Donald Trump is the answer in exactly the same way as uh, uh, you have had riots in some of the European uh, cities like Paris, for example. I mean, remember, Macron was seen as a far better replacement for President Hollande. I mean, he was, you know, he was the bright new guy. And what's, how's it turned out? People are even more discontent under him than they were under or launched. And the same is true in Greece, the same is true in Italy and Spain, where the Catalans want to break off. I mean, this is a problem. It's a worldwide problem. And um, you're not going to solve it, I think, uh, by trying to reform the system, because the reformers are the crony capitalists. They are, or, or if they're politicians, they're in there um, with uh, a stake in the old game, not the new game. I'm not saying that these people don't want reform. I, what I'm saying is they don't actually understand the depth of the problem. And it always comes as a huge, great shock when they suddenly find that they're unpopular. That, you know, they don't go out to be unpopular, they go out to help. I, I think there are very few politicians I have met who are genuinely evil. <laughs> I have met a few, but uh, <laughs> the majority of them actually want to do us good. But the system basically ensures they can't. So I'm afraid to say that the only way that change will come about, I think is probably after, it's rather like a phoenix will have to rise out of the ashes of the destruction. Mm -hmm. It's a horrid thought because um, no one wants to see things destroyed because people get hurt. But I just, I just sort of can't see how we can get to the point which you were asking the question about, um, by gentle means. I mean, unless we can suddenly find a wonderful leader who, uh, you know, has um, a, a, an idea of philosophy which allows him to understand these problems, him or her to understand these problems, and to force it through. But it's very, very difficult as a leader to get the support from everybody who's all being paid by crony capitalists and all the rest of it, and who have been educated in the system to have this common sense knocked out of them. I mean, I really don't know where you go. Hmm. So you think it's, it's going to take a huge catastrophe for people to... Yes, and that's back. not... That, absolutely, and that's not a good thing because, um, you know, you don't sort of have a catastrophe and then suddenly the sun comes out and it's all shining. No, if you get a, you know, an economic catastrophe... Like, uh, let's, let's say my concerns about a potential bear market developing which mirrors the 1929 to 1932 situation is going to mean an awful lot of people go out of work. And it's going to mean that people will, I mean, they'll turn to politicians who will make Donald Trump look like um, a raving moderate. I mean, <laughs> you know, th this, is the, this is the trouble. You, you, you cannot get economic disruption without a heightened risk of political destruction in, you know, following it. There was a, an economist called Hayek who wrote about this. Um, you know, he, 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 he wrote a, um, a very prophetic book, really, uh, originally, I think, in the 1930s, about what Hitler was doing. Um, and he called it the road, road to serfdom. And that's how we basically support the people who enslave us. <laughs> It's just so it's it's mind boggling, Alistair. Anyway, we have to we have to be cheerful. You know, we got yeah, to we have we to be, be cheerful. cheerful. It's, it's, yeah. um, it's just I, I think that's why people turn away from it. You know what I mean? Yes, because it's absolutely. So much easier just yeah. to you know go about your business <laughs> rather than try to fix it because you're up against a beast trying to fix it yeah. literally. So um, Mr. Trump has found this out. I think. <laughs> I think so. Yes. I think he has. Now, Alistair is silver still a monetary metal? Um, the answer is, it's difficult to, I think there are two, two answers to that question. Officially, definitely no. Um, but there's still a lot of people around the world who do accept silver as a form of money. 
Uh, and it wasn't so long ago when our, we had silver coins and um, our coins are now pretend silver. So you get, uh, you know, in, in America, you get, you, get, you get sort of, I don't know, um, smaller coins which look silver and <laughs> pretend, pretend silver. silver. Is there pretend uh, you know, the emotion is still there. <laughs> I think it's true to say that silver was really driven out by the gold standard before the First World War. And what was interesting was that when that happened, the price of silver actually fell quite sharply. And this was quite simply because uh, the demand for silver as money had effectively disappeared and been replaced by demand for gold. Um, I think, however, that as we get the inevitable destruction of fiat currencies, uh, that silver will come back. And um, in approximate terms, it's got twice the volatility of gold, slightly less than twice. So if we see the gold price rise from the current level to say something like, I don't know, let's say gold rises 100%, then you'd expect gold to rise somewhere between 150 and 200%. There does, I think, become a limitation on it because the demand for silver um, uh, as a form of money has also got to um, absorb the supply of silver released by um, uh, the dropping off of demand for silver for other means. Obviously, as silver as a silver price rises, then it's used for other things, you know, whether it's solar panels or whatever, um, that's going to change. The demand for it is going to change. So it would have to be absorbed. But I think that uh, there is so much fiat currency around that um, I have no doubt in my own mind that as that starts losing its purchasing power, there will be a return of silver uh, in people's minds uh, to a status of money. And then you're looking at something which at the moment is on over 80, um, uh, you know, the 80 ounces of silver buys one ounce of gold. If you go back uh, to Isaac Newton's time, it was something like 14 and a half or 15. I can't remember the exact figure. Ounces of silver equals one ounce of gold. So you can see that uh, on that basis, silver actually has a lot of potential in the event that fiat currencies really do start losing their purchasing power. It's quite the deal right now, isn't it, Silver? It certainly is. It yeah. certainly is. But it is mainly, it is mainly an industrial metal, um, and uh, it is consumed, unlike gold, which is stored. Um, so, you know, there are lots of things that have got to happen to silver before it truly does become money. Okay. Now, Alistair, turning now to your company, gold money. What is gold money? And how can everybody get more information about your work? Quite simply, gold money acts as custodian for people's precious metals. We buy and sell precious metals for our clients on their instruction. We give no advice, incidentally, no investment advice, no advice uh, um, on asset allocation or anything like that. Um, we, we have storage facilities all around the world so that our customers can select uh, where they store their gold. So an American resident might want to store their gold, say, in another jurisdiction like Switzerland uh, or Hong Kong or Singapore um, or London um, or even across the border in Toronto if they, if they want to go and visit it. Um, so uh, there are a number of choices. It's gold, silver, platinum, palladium. And also, we're now um, uh, offering uh, storage for money, but this is actually bank account. So there is, there is uh, if you like, you're not getting out of the bank, bank, banking system if you uh, s store sterling dollars, Swiss francs, Canadian dollars, euros with us. Um, also, uh, we store cryptocurrencies. So uh, we do that for only uh, Bitgold and also Ethereum at the moment. Um, but we are working on uh, um, a, a, a blockchain um, uh, 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 a system whereby you can store it s securely in a blockchain so that your identity is kept to yourself. That is something called BlockVault, which one of our directors is working on. We also have uh, a peer-to-peer -peer lending operation. So if you have 
gold and silver, um, gold or silver, uh, in, in, in storage in one of our vaults, then uh, you can borrow against it. We can lend you fiat currency against that. So that mobilizes your money, if you like, in, in fiat form. So that's, that's another thing which is which may be of interest. Um, the way you find more information about us is to log in on our website, which is goldmoney.com. And Gold Money is incorporated in Canada. Our um, head office is in, is, is in Toronto. We also have an operational office in Jersey. That's Jersey Channel Islands, not Jersey <laughs> uh, opposite New York. Right. Um, and um, we have, you know, we, we, we do uh, what called Know Your Client and uh, anti money laundering to full banking standards. So, Please don't come to us if you just want to hide. That's, you right. know, that's, we're, we're legit. We're legit. And it's important to be legit because if you're not legitimate, then you're just transferring risk from one customer to another customer. So our customers um, feel confident in what we do because we follow all the rules. Let's, let's put it that way. Beautiful, beautiful. Alistair, this has been an amazing interview. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's been very much my pleasure, Michelle. And next time I'm on, hopefully we can be a bit more cheerful. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. We don't want to, hopefully by then they'll have solved this situation. Mr. Well, Alistair. Dream on. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, dream on. Mr. Alistair McLeod, head of research at goldmoney.com. For the industry experts panel, I'm Michelle Holliday at portfoliowealthglobal.com.